Calimera and welcome to Stupid Ancient History, Stupid A-Level Greeks. The sun is shining, I'm wearing a toga and today we're going to look at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. So before we begin I should point out that this video is largely going to be an overview of events and the emphasis here is going to be on the impact of this battle on Greek and non-Greek relations. Uh, if you want a far more detailed and much more hilarious retelling of the story, uh, there is a GCSE podcast for this. Um, I will put a link below. That will give you more detail about people such as Philippides and all the crazy shenanigans that goes on there. Um, this, like I said, is going to be focusing more on the A-level course, looking at how this event changes relations. So previously on Stupid A-Level Greeks, we've looked at the changing relationship, particularly between Greece and Persia, as a result of the Ionian Revolt, and particularly Athens' involvement in that. We've also looked at Darius's previous attempt to remember the Athenians, or otherwise known as conquer the Athenians, um, led by Mydonius, and what happened to that when he came across a bunch of sea monsters. We also looked at how Darius's demand for earth and water from the rest of the Greek states met with, shall we say, a mixed response. Some states giving earth and water, um, Athens and Sparta being less generous to the Persian messengers, throwing them down a well or into a pit. Um, and as a result, Athens and now Sparta as well have put themselves firmly in harm's way. And it makes sense to begin our story in Persia, particularly looking at the preparations for what is to become the Battle of Marathon. So following Mardonius' attempt to take Greece uh, in 492, Darius attempts a bold new strategy. This northern route through Thrace, Thassos and Macedonia didn't really pay the dividends he wanted. So Mardonius is effectively put on the naughty step. He's, he's still alive, he still survived, but he is overlooked for command of this new expedition. Instead, Darius goes to two more aristocrats, Persian aristocrats, a guy called Artaphernes, not the guy from the Ionian Revolt, and another called Dartis. These two are the two who were put in charge, and it seems largely they are chosen because of their aristocratic nature, rather than their military expertise. Um, and they are given quite a sizable force of infantry, cavalry, and accompanying ships. They also take with them an Athenian, a guy called Hippias. He is one of the exiled oligarchs from the Athenian Democratic Revolution. He is from the Pisistratid family, and he seems he is going to be quite instrumental in getting this expedition off the ground and doing something worthwhile. He obviously brings with him local knowledge of Attica, so he's effectively a bit of a guide where to land, what to do. He also undoubtedly goes to Darius and assures him he can gather some local support. The oligarchs again believing that they weren't fully ousted, that they would still have some supporters um, given their prior wealth and position. But again, it's not unlikely that in terms of Hippias's joining this expedition, he is trying to align himself as a future tyrant or future satrap of Athens. If Darius is to take Greece, if he is to take Athens, he will need someone to rule the region for him. And who better than a former Pisistratid oligarch, Hippias. So this is the start of the preparation. Troops, ships, local knowledge and two leaders. And it's quite important that we point out that he takes a completely different route. He takes a completely different approach. Rather than the lengthy round the houses route that Mardonius chose to take over the Hellespont, this time Darius's invasion force is going straight to Athens, straight to Attica. They're taking a southern route via the Cyclades Islands. This obviously is a bit riskier because you have to cross more sea and crossing the sea is always da a danger because your ships could sink. But he's not playing around anymore. He's going straight to Athens. The Athenians are going to get remembered. And this is where we get to with the Battle of Marathon. 
Now, as we said, this southern route is a far riskier route and it requires a good degree of island hopping. Crossing the Aegean with such a large force at this point in history would not be an easy feat. It's certainly not something you do overnight. Um, and as with most crossings of the Aegean at this time in history, but also this time of year, late August, early September, um, the invasion force will have to make a few stops in these Cyclidean islands, almost like stepping stones, in order to get to Attica. But it seems with these stops, these are really quite deliberate. So the invasion force set sail, all is good, and their first stop is the island of Naxos. If you remember, this was one of the root causes of the Ionian Revolt. And rather than just stopping there to resupply, refuel and have a rest, the Persians take the island and sack the major cities. Again, this is Darius's tying up loose ends, dealing with anyone he sees as being a trouble causer previously. So they stop at Naxos, they sack the city, they take the island, they burn a bunch of stuff, they get back on the boats, and they head off. Next stop on their little Greek odyssey is the island of Delos. This is a holy island, bang in the middle of the Aegean, said to be the birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. And as a result, when the Persians land on Delos, even though the population see them come in and swiftly do a runner, thinking they're next to be sacked, the Persians actually leave Delos alone. If anything, they leave offerings to Apollo at temples. Um, Delos had no role in the Ionian Revolt, but it also speaks to kind of Darius's not wanting to if interfere with foreign gods or other people's gods. So the invasion force stop, they have a rest, they make offerings to the temple, and they leave Delos unscathed. Next step on their little journey is the city-state of Eretria. This is a bit of a detour, um, but again, this is quite a deliberate detour, because Eretria, along with Athens, originally sent troops um, and ships to help the Ionian Revolt. And Darius, as we've seen before, is not one to leave things undealt with. So we're told there's a short siege, a few days, um, where the Persians are attempting to enter the city, the Eretrians are having none of it, they've locked the gates, until it seems towards the end of this siege, two Eretrians, literally two people, open the city gates, thinking, what's the worst that can happen? And funnily enough, the Persians enter the city and sack it and burn it and do the usual enslaving and so on. Um, Eretria is dealt with, and now the only people left to deal with from the Ionian Revolt are the Athenians, and off the head. It's probably a good point here to use Eretria as a good example of um, division within Greek city-states. There is a danger or a tendency to assume that Greek city-states act as um, a single entity, as a homogenous map, um, homogenous mass or group. With the sacking of Eretria, it's quite clear that they're not um, there will have been divided opinion in the city-state of Eretria about what to do. The majority clearly thinking keep the Persians out, they're here, they're up to no good, they are going to destroy our city. But then there will have been others within the city-state who would have been more favourable to reaching a negotiation with Darius, potential Medizers. And certainly the two guys who open the city gates and let the Persians in, they would fall under this second category. Obviously, not a great decision on their part for the rest of Eretria. But again, it highlights that not all city-states work uniformly. They don't always agree. And that's the same for any group of people. You get any number of people in a room, 100 people in a room, they are going to disagree. So why would Greek city-states be any different? The point being that when we look at relations between Greek city-states, between themselves and the Persians, it's not uniform. You're always going to have differences of opinion. And it's whoever is the dominant faction at the time, they are the ones who determine what happens. So, island hopping done, journey complete, the Persians land at the Bay of Marathon. And you've got a nice little map of the bay on the screen just to give you some idea of why. 
Marathon represents an ideal location to land a force such as the Persians on Greek territory. It's close to Athens, that's the key thing. But it, in itself, it is an ideal location. It provides a good natural harbour. There's this little sticky out bit like a dog leg of land um, on the right hand of your screen, which acts as a bit of a natural harbour to stop the ships being destroyed by unpleasant weather, by storms and so on. When they land, the landing ground is protected by this great marsh, which means any Greek force coming to attack them cannot cross this. They've channeled in from the left. Um, obviously heavily armed bronze armed hoplites will sink in this marsh and even the Greeks knew to stay away from swamps because bad things happen. Outside of the original landing area um, we see a flat plain which is unusual for this part of Greece particularly at this time because Attica is quite a rugged mountainous hilly piece of land so you've got an ideal flat plain here which is not only great to graze your cavalry this key part of the persian army but should there be a conflict or should there be a battle going on here which no spoilers or anything there is um this would be the perfect place for the persian cavalry to fight they're like big flat open plains where they can use their speed and maneuverability to their advantage they're not so great going up hills and mountains more broadly though the location of marathon is really strategically important. It's close to an essential Athenian supply route from Euboea. Um, the Athenians have to import large amounts of food from Euboea, so any protracted siege would need this supply route. So the Athenians really can't ignore this Persian force that's just turned up right near the supply line. Um, so Marathon presents a really good landing site for this Persian force. And it seems as well, as the Persians are coming to land at Marathon, as they are approaching the coastline, again we see this issue of homogeneity. According to Herodotus, there's an accusation that some Athenians are actually signalling the Persians, giving them the all clear. This would suggest, as Hippias is hoping, and as Hippias is selling his plan to Darius, this would suggest that not everyone in Athens is completely against Persian intervention, or not everyone in Athens is completely on board with this democratic experiment that's taken root there, this new form of government. So it seems that there are some locals, some people in and around Athens who are not too bothered about the arrival of the Persians. It may well signal a change in their favour should the Persians take Athens. So in this onto this ideal place this ideal landing spot with its well defended beach and its big open plains near to a supply route and seemingly with local support the persians land and they begin to set up camp ready to push their attack on athens so let's have a quick change of view and go and see what's happening in athens obviously the arrival of this persian force does not go unnoticed by modern estimates, we're looking at over 100,000 men. If you include all the ships and the armed sailors, it's a significant force who've just rocked up to the shores of Attica. And not wanting to take on the Persians entirely on their own, uh, the Athenians dispatch a messenger, Pheidippides, to call on Sparta to send help. Again, I'm not going to go into this story here. There's the GCSE Persians video that covers this in much more detail. But again, it is worth highlighting here that this is a good example of changing Greek relations depending on the need at the time. Athens and Sparta are not natural allies. If anything, they are quite fierce rivals already. Um, but what's interesting here is they found themselves with a shared dilemma. Athens, through their involvement in the Ionian Revolt, and Sparta, through their sheer bloody-mindedness and being stubborn, they find themselves firmly in harm's way, with Darius breathing down the neck. So even though there's no formal agreement or treaty really between the two, they find themselves as fair-weather friends, um, coincidental allies, by the fact they have a shared enemy. So the Athenians dispatch a messenger hoping the Spartans will join them in routing the Persians and sending them packing. 
And, you know, why not? This is the Spartans. This is what they do. Surely if anyone in Greece is up for a scrap, it's the Spartans, the military hegemon of all Greece at this time, even though it's largely the Peloponnesian League, and it's Sparta. What do they do? They like a fight. So Pheidippides is dispatched. And while Pheidippides is off running the length of all of southern Greece, um, the Athenians start getting themselves into gear. They mobilise the Athenian army, which at best guess by modern scholars, we're looking at roughly between eight and 10,000 men. These leave Athens and head off to Marathon to try and blockade the Persians where they are because they don't want them interfering with this supply line. When they reach Marathon, they are joined by a smaller contingent of Plataean troops, maybe about a thousand. Now, Plataea is not a major player. It's a smallish city-state just near, between Athens and Thebes. And they found themselves in this position because they've allied themselves with Athens, interestingly at the suggestion of Cleomenes, the king of Sparta, because they've had previous disagreements with Thebes, um, and they'd hoped Athens would protect them against Thebes. This was all a bit of an elaborate plan by Cleomenes, because obviously he's hoping this alliance will drag Athens and Thebes into direct conflict, which will give him legal cause to declare war on Athens. Unfortunately for him, that does not happen at this point because the Persians turn up. So the Athenians gather at Marathon, they establish a defensive position, hopefully that will cut off any Persian raids on their essential supply lines. And whilst they're there, the ten tribes of Athens, the ten generals, um, particularly under the guidance of the Archon Callimachus, they elect Miltiades as Polymarch, the military leader for the battle. Miltiades, of course, is a good choice for the job. He's had previous experience fighting the Persians. He was one of the men who led the Athenian force to the Ionian Revolt. Um, and he duly goes about planning what to do next. So they form a defensive position in a handy, narrow pass, which the Greeks love, to try and hem in or block in the Persian force, almost like a cork. Now ultimately the Athenians are hoping to get Spartan reinforcements, um, but they receive the message that the Spartans are not coming. Uh, they are celebrating, celebrating Carnea, a religious festival at the time, so they decide their army cannot leave Sparta. One thing about the Spartans, they are a very, very religious and pious people, so they're not going to go to war when the gods say don't do it. So the Athenians are kind of left out on their own and now their situation has become a lot more desperate. Um, it's unlikely they'll be able to maintain the force there until the Spartans arrive. So they have to do something even though they are massively outnumbered. But it's not all bad for Miltiades and his Athenian force because it's worth pointing out here that it seems that seeing such a tiny, irrelevant force, less than a tenth of the size of the Persian force, it seems the Persians dispatch their cavalry back onto the ships to sail round the Horn of Attica and head directly to Athens, thinking it is now undefended. Herodotus doesn't explicitly say this is the case, however there is no mention of Persian cavalry, the best of the Persian troops, um, for the remainder of the battle. So it's likely that in this act of potential hubris, the Persian commanders decide they don't need the cavalry to defeat this tiny little army. They send the Persian cavalry back on the ships, head straight to Athens to try and take the city while the army is out at Marathon. If nothing else, the fall of the city will force Miltiades and his 10,000 hoplites to surrender. So the scene is set for what is ultimately to become an infantry battle with the absence of the Persian cavalry. So step one of the battle, um, the Athenians actually do something quite unexpected. Um, very, very unusual for hoplite warfare at this time, certainly taking on a significantly larger force than their own. The Athenians move out of their defensive position where they could best use their heavy armour and their heavy shields as a blockade 
and they move out into open ground where they are effectively exposed and it's more easy for the Persians to surround them. Once they then reach this open ground, the Persians move out from their positions to meet them. The Athenians then do something else completely unexpected. They charge the Persian forces. Obviously the Athenians are much more heavily armed, their armour is heavier, their weapons are heavier, and running, effectively carrying half your own body weight in armour is not easy. So this is a bit of a surprise, but it's all part of this grand plan of Miltiades. Now, obviously in this open ground with a force like the Persians who are much more nimble on their feet, much more able to stretch out, the main threat to the Greeks is being surrounded or being encircled. Now to counter this, Miltiades stretches out his central phalanx, this central body of his army, um, he stretches it out as far as he can so the tips of the Greek force are able to reach the same lengths that the Persians do. This will hopefully stop them being outflanked, it will stop the Persians being able to simply step around the Greeks and attack from the side. So the point is to stop them being outflanked. Again, it would have been much easier for the Persians to overcome the Greeks had they kept their cavalry there. Um, there really would have been no way to stop this fast-moving force surrounding the Greeks. But the problem Miltiades faces now is that this central phalanx, the centre of his line, is only half as deep at best as it should be. So from about eight men to four men. It is significantly weaker. Now this is a bit of a gamble. So the two forces meet in the centre. There's a clash of these two armies. Herodotus isn't great at describing this particular conflict. Um, if you want a more graphic and bloodthirsty description of the meeting of hoplites and Persian forces at Marathon, Tom Holland's Persian fight does a really good job of describing this. So the two forces meet and as expected, this weakened centre that Miltiades has created to stretch out the Greek line is now starting to buckle. They are now starting to feel the pressure of this full-on Persian assault. So they're starting to struggle, but not yet break. The Persians see this and seeing their opportunity to effectively break the Greeks into two and surround both forces, the Persians continue to press their advantage force the troops into this central part of the battlefield. They're hoping that this weak phalanx will break, they will fall back, they will, the line will split, and this will allow the Persian troops to force their way through and start breaking up the Greek force. But this is ultimately a trap. Miltiades is not one to make foolish errors. He's deliberately weakened the centre, he's stretched it out as much as he can, but it seems that the centre is not just your average commoner garden Athenians. These, it seems, are his best and most loyal troops, the people he can rely on to stay the line, hold the line, stand the ground, and fight with everything they've got. So the Persians keep pushing the centre, pushing men into this centre, and Miltiades' men, as is part of his plan, slowly start to move backwards. There's no way they can move forward against this sheer weight of numbers. Again, we're looking at twice, if not ten times, the amount of soldiers on the Persian side as the Greek side. So they start to feign a measured retreat, stepping back slightly. Now, as the centre starts to buckle and give way and seems to retreat, and the Persians throw all the everything they've got at the centre, the kitchen sink, you know, some guy with one arm, everything's going at the centre. While the focus is there and the centre is starting to move back, it seems that the left and right wings of Miltiades' force, however, are now able to start moving forward and wheel round and slowly begin to start enveloping the Persians themselves. Um, the Persians are pretty much just a big splodge in the middle and these two wings of Miltiades' force are able to pivot round and get the Persians and trap them, pin them in a pincer movement. So rather than the fight simply being at the front of the Persian force, 
they now face Greeks attacking them from the side. So at this point in the battle, it seems everything is coming up Miltiades. The Greeks start to push their advantage, start digging into the sides of this Persian force. And the Persians at the side and the back, seeing these Greeks coming and attacking them when really they should be fighting further ahead, they start to panic and they start to run, effectively cutting off the head of the Persian force, trapping them in this Greek pincer movement. Herodotus describes the Persians as a bit of an undisciplined mob who all, to a man, start to turn around and just run as fast as they can, leg it back to the ships, because he, the troops at the back are now in harm's way when they don't expect to be. The troops at the front are now effectively being cut off by the Greeks. And if anything, they are really, really regretting having to sent the cavalry away now. Pretty dumb move. So the Persians start turning and start running back to the ships it's every man for himself now get back on the boat and let's just get out of here the greeks in turn start to give chase and they chase after the persians all the way back to the ships and they start as herodotus describes they start slaughtering the fleeing persians by the ships um it's a complete washout for the persian forces arguably by modern estimates we reckon about 5,000 Persians die, some contemporary Greek sources give it as high as six or 7,000, and the Athenians come out with just over 100 casualties themselves, which is a very low number given what's been going on. So the Persians are now in full retreat, they're back on the ships, Marathon has been secured by the Athenians and Plataeans, what's left of the Persian force has run back onto its ship, and is now setting sail. But it's no time to celebrate for Miltiades and his men though. Once they get the ship, Persians back on the ships, they realise that realistically they've only fought half the Persian force. Um, there's some significant chunks of the Persians that landed missing, particularly the cavalry it would seem. Um, and they realise that yes, this other Persian force is halfway on its way to Athens, they're sailing around the coast, and unless they get back to Athens before the Persians get there, the city will effectively fall. So, straight after the battle, tired from stabbing all the Persians they can get their hands on, the Athenian troops in full armour, shields, spears, wounds, the lot, having run across a battlefield as well, they now have to run the 26 miles from the Battle of Marathon back to Athens. And this is where we get this is the original marathon, this 26 mile run, but obviously these guys are doing it in full plate armour, carrying weapons after having fought a battle, they're not dressed as a pantomime horse, so the original marathon was probably a fair deal harder to do than the London Marathon. So without the aid of proper running shoes, months of training, nipple tape, those people handing out cups of water throughout the marathon, the Athenians run back to Athens, and it seems they make it in time. As the Persian fleet approaches the Piraeus harbour in Athens, late afternoon as the sun's starting to go down, we're told as they approach they see the silhouettes of hoplites lining the harbour walls. So they can see the distinctive outline of the helmets, the spears, the shields, lining the walls, showing that the city is not undefended. I mean, it's worth pointing out at this point that had the Persians tried pushing this attack, it really might not have gone well for the Athenians, because these soldiers now, after a full day of fighting and a 26-mile run in heavy armour, they're going to be pretty knackered. They'll literally be holding themselves up with the spears on these city walls. It's a show of force. Um, it's a bluff, but it pays off. This advance party to Athens was definitely a gamble. It's unlikely um, any Persian force, particularly cavalry, would be unable would be able to take the city with its narrow streets against a local force who knew the city, knew the blockage points. Um, so effectively, seeing the hoplites on the on the Piraeus walls, the Athenians turn round and sail back to Persia. Their dreams of destroying Athens um, 
is now in tatters. They've effectively suffered a double defeat. So either through Persian hubris or Athenian tactical brilliance, the Battle of Marathon is over and the Persians are defeated. The Athenians are victorious and this is what, where the focus of what we're looking at should really start to emerge. This is starting to really map out this rise of Athens. Remember prior to the Battle of Marathon, Sparta was the established power. Athens were keen to expand and make their name known um, in what effectively becomes the Thucydides trap. And the Athenians can now use this to propel themselves as a claimant to the hit to be the heroes of Greece. This small scrappy band of Athenians, not the legendary Spartans who are pure born warriors, these scrappy Athenians have defeated the armies of Darius, a significant force, on their own, with the help of Plataea. Um, so they are now, they certainly sell this as being the heroes of Greece and everything about Marathon from this point on, from an Athenian point of view, is so heavily mythologised. This is their Battle of Britain, their, this is their Britain, England winning the World Cup in 1966. This is the moment they all refer back to. Vases are made commemorating it, poems are written, songs are sung, Athens go into full-on glorification of their military power as a result of Marathon. The Spartans actually do turn up after Carnea, so they finish celebrating, they turn up at Marathon after the battle, obviously, um, and they inspect the bodies of the Persians. This is their, their sole role in the Battle of Marathon. Um, we're told they commend the Athenians for defeating such a significant force. Bit of a bit of a side eye pat on the back because with that comes the realization on the Spartans certainly, but also in wider Greece, that this great and terrible army of Persia really isn't that great and terrible after all. They see the lightly armed Persians in their kind of light tunics and the little felt hats and their six foot spears and the wicker shields and there's going to be a degree of the Spartans going, well yeah that looks easy, they're, they're barely armed at all, we've got all this heavy armour, bigger shields, bigger spears, well done Athens but you know to be fair our women could probably have beaten the Athenians. So Sparta have to take their inaction on the chin but they're not about to let Athens celebrate too much they're not allowed about to let Athens claim the position as the top dog in Greece the Athenians and their allies however are going hard at celebrating they are now the heroes of Greece they have bragging rights over all of Greece and also it suggests to some within Athens particularly that maybe the Persian hold on the Ionian states and on the wider Greek world could actually easily be uprooted. They've fought off a significant force. It seems the Persian numbers effectively mean nothing against well-armed Greek troops led by a cunning and savvy leader like Miltiades. So this gives them the confidence to now move on and start pressing their agenda to give themselves the top spot in all of Greece. Dislodging Sparta, which is obviously not going to sit well with Sparta, and as a result their Peloponnesian allies, um, but Athens now are the new hot ticket in Greece, and they are making everyone know about it. Which again, if you are someone like Thebes, or Sparta, or Corinth, who aren't big fans of Athens, this is going to get pretty annoying. So, there you have it, a quick overview of the Battle of Marathon, particularly looking at its impact on the Greek world and Greek and non-Greek relations, its particular importance in, as a propaganda victory for Athens and the starting point for this Athenian rise to what they see as dominance and also as a prelude to what happens next because even though they're defeated, the Persians are not gone entirely. Hopefully this has been useful, thank you for listening, leave us a comment below, and until next time, goodbye.